welcome to Wide Angle this week. Two significant developments, one political and one in the courts, have put some wind in the Congress party's sail. One, of course, the Gujarat uh, numbers that they came up with, 80 seats, more than uh, what many people anticipated, and uh, a moral victory of sorts, people say, for the Congress party. The other one, in the special CBI court set up to investigate the 2G scam, which has essentially been an indictment of the CBI's investigation and thrown out those cases for now. Joining us to discuss how these two developments will impact the Congress party in 2018 as it gears up for at least six assembly elections and, of course, looking forward to 2019, is Manish Tiwari, former Information and Broadcasting Minister of the UPA government and a distinguished fellow at a Washington-based think tank, the Atlantic Council. Manish Tiwari, thanks very much for being with us. First question really on the 2G scam and the trial court's verdict this week. Um, the Congress has come out and celebrated it as a vindication of its stand, but I think more than a vindication of the Congress party, the court has really been uh, critical of the CBI and its a uh, slow progress on gathering evidence. Do you think the Congress's celebrations on that are a little premature? Well, thank you, Maya, for having me on your show. Look, uh, it wasn't a scam even in the first place. Uh, when the CNAG report uh, came out in the November of 2010, and uh, the report alleged that uh, there was a presumptive loss of 1,76,000 crores, even at that point in time, we had debunked it very strongly. Subsequently, as a member of the Joint Parliamentary Committee, which looked into the entire 2G issue, I had the occasion of cross-examining Mr. Vinod Rai over a period of three days. And it was amply clear that the report uh, did not have feet to stand on. It had foundations of sand. And subsequently, that got reflected in the report of the Joint Parliamentary Committee tabled to Parliament in the January of 2014. Unfortunately, it sank without a trace because in the din of the ensuing Lok Sabha elections. And now you have a criminal court, which after a seven-year trial, scrutinizing evidence, uh, listening to the prosecution and the defense, has concluded that there was no scam. In fact, the most damning indictment in that report is when the judge says that a bunch of facts were so artfully arranged in order to give a perception as if a humongous scam had been perpetrated when there was no scam in the first place. And mm. since this is not about the 2G, so therefore I will not dwell on it at any length. But the reality is that in 1994-95, there were a bunch of operators who got licenses. Then in 2001, again, there was a bunch of operators who got licenses. The period of these licenses was initially 10 years and it was subsequently uh, extended in 1999 to 20 years. Mm. Those licenses were supposed to expire in 2016, 2015, 2016. Now, in 2008, when a new bunch of operators got licenses at, the, at 2001 prices, which is 1651 crores for a circle, uh, it upset the incumbent operators. And therefore, in that corporate war, because if those guys would have got their licenses, it would have been operationalized, they would have continued till 2028. Right. So in that corporate war, the CNDG unfortunately be became a cat's paw and gave a report which completely derailed the Indian economy, which besmirched India's fair name, an economy which had, 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 had come out of uh, the great economic meltdown, you know, eventually got completely sidewinded by this but this 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 baseless report but manish there are two aspects to this one of course is the fact that these uh, uh, these licenses in any case were, were thrown out by the supreme court which then set it up for auction the 122 licenses given uh, by uh, a raja now that part of it the policy part of it that was tackled that was dealt with by the supreme court when they opened it up to auction but the notion of crony capitalism of bribery um, i mean Again, going back to what the trial court has said this week, it's not so much that those charges are baseless or those charges are false. In fact, it is basically telling the CBI they haven't done its job, that it hasn't done its job gathering enough evidence against the Congress party. Do you really feel that this could not be challenged further? The High Court may not overturn this. I mean, the, there is a long road legally still. Well, Maya, uh, with great respect to the Supreme Court, we had disagreed with the judgment even then. 
You see, the policy of giving admin or spectrum at administered prices to private players was put in place by the new telecom policy in 1994 when the telecom sector was liberalized. It went across the Narsim Rao administration, the Devagauda administration, the Inder Kumar Gujaral administration, the Atal Bihari Vajpayee six years and then eight years of Dr. Manmohan Singh's administration. If you have such high levels of teledensity in this country and you have almost zero tariffs, it's primarily because in the nascent years, you did not auction spectrum and you gave it at administered prices. Mm. Now in 2013, post the Supreme Court order, which the UPA government very dutifully implemented, you auction spectrum. And what do you have today? You have a completely stressed out telecom sector. Telecom operators are going to the government with a hat in hand asking for a bailout, which according to some estimates, in fact in the wire itself there was a report, is to the tune of 4.5 lakh crores. And the rationale which is being extended by the government is that if we don't bail them out, the entire banking sector will collapse. Mm. So therefore, if you look at it in a 20 year perspective, I don't think that the policy of giving spectrum at administered prices, which the Supreme Court in its judgment struck down, was actually a wrong policy. Uh, Manish Tavari, let's just turn this a little political. So, on the one hand, you have corporates who were so supposedly involved uh, in receiving these beneficial licenses uh, under the 2G scam. Uh, the Congress party saying no, there was no crony capitalism, there was no bribery, there was no corruption as far as this is concerned and standing vindicated or claiming to be vindicated on this. On the other hand, what we saw in Gujarat, um, Rahul Gandhi on his campaign trail naming some of these very corporates uh, as recipients or involved in crony capitalism and bribery with this government. So can it be said that these corporates w are not at all to be indicted? Well. Uh Look, I am not going to make a value judgment with regard to a particular corporate or not. Hmm. But the fact remains is that you cannot compare apples and pears. Uh, there may be a situation whereby somebody was charged and ultimately it has come out wrongly charged and they have been honorably exonerated. Hmm. And that's an exoneration which you have to accept because you talked about an appeal earlier. Remember, this is an appeal against acquittal. So therefore, the, uh, the prosecuting agency will have to take the leave of the court even to file an appeal against acquittal. The bar for filing an appeal against acquittal is much higher. And the burden and, of proof gets and the burden of, burden of And number two, you know, it's very, very uh, surprising that even before the ink had dried on the judgment, and this is important, the CBI and the ED come out and say we are going to file an appeal. Look, these are not private lawyers. These are sovereign uh, bodies performing state functions. Mm. They have to exercise a modicum of impartiality, of objectivity. So without even reading the judgment, without even perusing as to why the judge has come to certain conclusions and their independent directorates of prosecution, both in the ED and the CBI, set up in terms of the Jain Hawala judgment in 1996, you've suddenly come to a conclusion that you'll file an appeal. And, 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 and therefore, as one one of the uh, former officers of the CBI was pointing out yesterday that you know merely filing an appeal for the purposes of filing an appeal is actually wasting taxpayers money. You need to come to a definitive conclusion that uh, there are grounds to be appealed ag uh, uh, against and now coming to your Rahul Gandhi question, you are absolutely correct. You see, so therefore there may be instances where the evidence of crony capitalism against a particular uh, person or a particular industrial house may be there. There may be other instances whereby that uh, level of evidence is not there. So therefore, we need to be extremely careful and extremely circumspect because when you make a charge against somebody, that charge should be able to withstand not only the scrutiny of public perception, but legal scrutiny also. The 2G hmm. withstood the scrutiny of public perception but fell like a house of cards in a court of law. So, okay, on the question of public perception, I mean, are you in a sense moving away from the 2G scam? I mean, there's, there's been a whole lot that's taken place in the last one week as far as the Congress party is concerned. 
you know, uh, Rahul Gandhi's anointment uh, as the president, um, the Gujarat result, which really the Congress is claiming as a moral victory, even though, I mean, in elections, Jo Jita Vahi Sikandar. So, you know, the BJP has still won a clear majority in the state. Um, nonetheless, taking, taking from that, I think a couple of questions to you. One is that we saw two things emerge in, in the Gujarat campaign. One is clearly a more aggressive uh, Congress party, a clear, uh, more aggressive Rahul Gandhi. The second is trying to also find the, fight the BJP on not physically but ideologically its home turf. And is that some is that a route the Congress party wants to take? Because there's been allegations of soft Hindutva that the Congress party has used on the ground. This whole controversy over not just a Hindu but a Janayudhari Hindu was that a necessary comment from the Congress party? And you know, when it comes to charges of corruption and crony capitalism, are these taints that the Congress can move away from and fight the BJP on these very taints as well? Because in a sense, you're using their own arguments, you know, back at them. Well, first of all, uh, I don't think that uh, it's a good idea for any political party uh, to get into the habit of coming runners up. You know, ultimately, you need to emerge as a winner in the election. Right. But having said that, I think if you look at the Gujarat result in a perspective, uh, the fact remains that you lost 10 seats below 2,800 votes. Uh, three or four of your our state leaders, unfortunately, uh, could not retain their seats. Uh, so therefore, uh, you've really lost Gujarat by a whisker and this could have been a completely different result altogether. The conundrum still remains and since I had looked after Gujarat for the Congress earlier, I know a little bit about it that we have not been able to crack the riddle of surmounting urban Gujarat. Urban Gujarat, notwithstanding all the movement against GST and uh, various other uh, factors, has still it's stood by the BJP. The BJP right? city, yes. So, I think if you were to extrapolate that to the national level, one of the fundamental challenges for the Congress party remains as to how to identify with the or re-identify with the urban middle class mm. and really get the aspirational narrative going. Because if you go back to 2009, the reason why the Congress went up from 144 seats to 206 seats was essentially because you swept every city mm. uh, from Thiruvananthapuram till Jammu. So you won every city across this country and I think the whole esoteric Indo-US nuclear deal you know, somehow uh, played a role in that. So that's the reconnect that you have to establish. Number two, you see ideological clarity is very essential. When the founders of the Indian Republic actually uh, went down the path of secularism, it was a classical Western concept which they extrapolated into the Indian constitution and it finds mention even before 1974 when it was put in the preamble because they knew that in a deeply religious country there has to be a clear separation between the church and the state. Over a period of time, the inheritors of the founders of the republic reinterpreted it to mean Sardham Sambhav. Now, this is the fundamental question which the Congress has to uh, confront. Do we go back to the classical definition of secularism, which is a clear separation between the church and the state and religion is a completely private activity or do we recognize that we have moved down the road in 70 years where secularism today actually means that you know you have not only equal respect for all faiths but you go to all the religious but, but places and 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 more importantly even state patronage of religion is, is fine. But that doesn't answer this question, I mean, in fact, that's a very interesting point that you've made that even state patronage of religion might be fine. The Congress has been accused periodically of creating a situation where communal and communalism, which are neutral terms in, in sort of uh, the English language, have taken on this meaning of violence. I mean, you know, it's minority communalism versus majority communalism. It's appeasement of the minorities versus the neglect of the majority. This kind of binary debate. Uh, many people say it was the Congress and its historical policies that were responsible for it. And every time the Congress has felt that it needs to come back and plan its revival or consolidate its support, it has fallen back on this acceptance of Ram Rajya or of Janayudhari Hinduism. I mean, is this the language we want to be hearing from the Congress party? Well, Maya, <coughs> you see, there is a distinction which needs to be made. 
and the distinction is between uh, religiosity, between fundamentalism, between revivalism, and communalism, and these are four separate terms but which have elitism, which 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 have have four different also meanings. Also, elitism because so, Janayu Dhari was a very specifically so, elitist. So 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 so, so, so 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 therefore, as long as you know you believe in your faith and you profess it even privately or publicly and at times you have to do it publicly if it is challenged. For example, if it wouldn't have been for that stupid and absolutely imbecile display of registers of the Somnath temple, uh, you would not have had a reaction in terms of somebody having to publicly establish his faith, which I think uh, for any individual you know, who is uh, who's, who's liberal is, is, is extremely repugnant. But the important thing is that the Congress party over all these years has never used religion in terms of a communalist agenda which is predicated on either uh, festering violence or dividing people in the name of uh, religion. I think that's the important distinction that we have to make. So how do you make that message going forward? We started this interview by saying there are six assembly elections coming up in 2018. This is the last interview of 2017 that we're doing uh, for this show. Now you tell me that when you have Karnataka, which is a highly polarized state coming up first, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, uh, which have seen uh, the BJP incumbent uh, over there um, and several uh, instances of polarization and communal violence uh, across some of these states. How does the Congress party plan to reflect on the gains from uh, Gujarat as you say that you see them and move forward towards the next phase of election campaigning and a reimagination of the party? Well, uh, first and foremost, I think you need to make a distinction between an electoral cycle, which in India's context plays itself out every, every year, year and year right, after right. year. And then, you know, also look at a uh, reassessment of ideological positions. And I think first and foremost, and this is my personal view, uh, and I've written about it also. You see, even on the question of economic liberalization, Kue an economy for the 99%, and especially the fundamental question as to whether it is acceptable uh, to be rich if your wealth comes from legitimate means through enterprise and entrepreneurship is a question which the Congress will have to answer if it wants to identify itself with the aspirational middle class, which unfortunately it lost completely in 2014. The second, of course, is the question of secularism that we discussed, that what is the kind of uh, secularism that or what uh, nuance of secularism. Because you made a very interesting comment on that earlier about yes, the state and religion. That's right. So, so what, 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 what is the kind, what is the nuance of secularism which you need to adopt going forth? Then the question of nationalism per se, that you know, how do you distinguish your nationalism from the kind of uh, extremely uh, hate-filled narrative on nationalism which has been playing itself out over the past three years. Then on the question of tactics that organizationally, you know, how do you go back and make yourself more resurgent and, and robust. So therefore, there are four or five large ideological and organizational issues which will have to be clinched. And I think uh, possibly when you have a new presidency, you have a change of guard. That's always a good time to go and revisit these issues irrespective so of the many, fact the that you are in the last year of this government. And obviously, if you look at it politically, maybe getting the BJP and Prime Minister Narendra Modi out, you know, should be your first priority. But the one thing that you haven't touched upon when you talk about the Congress party trying to reassess or needing to reassess, especially on social policy, economic policy, uh, you know, secularism, uh, etc. The one thing that no Congress politician is willing to actually openly talk about is on, on dynasty, which has become the biggest uh, sort of, you know, in terms of public perception, the biggest problem with the Congress that it's, you, it, it cannot imagine itself without a Gandhi at the helm. I mean, is it time for the Congress also to look at its other rank and file and leaders, some of whom done very well in their own states, and maybe say that it's time that we have a non-Gandhi actually leading the party. When you have a former Prime Minister like Manmohan Singh, uh, you know, welcome Rahul with the kind of words that he did, you, you sort of wonder, I mean, you know, this is a man who led the country for 10 years, talking about somebody who's you know young enough to be his son 
and yes it's great to get the blessings of elders but there's a level of psychophancy that you don't want to see in such senior leaders of the congress well it's interesting that you raise this question and i think it needs to be answered squarely you see not only in south asia and i'm de- i'm broadening the uh, landscape but if you look across uh, large parts of asia and africa which emerged from the yoke of colonialism and imperialism in the late 40s and early 50s it is not unknown that for political parties to voluntarily organize themselves around a single individual and take him to be a leader so therefore it is not only the congress you look at the pdp you look at the national conference you yes. look at the akali yeah. dal you look at uh, chandra babu naidu and uh, not yeah. only india i mm. mean you look at pakistan you look at bangladesh you look at sri lanka and i can go on chapter yeah. and verse so therefore you know according to me this whole debate around dynasty is really an overhyped stick to beat the congress with Yes if let's suppose you want a level of egalitarianism mm-hmm. in your political parties or in your political system then it has to really go across and not limit itself only to politics you know what about the profession of law what about the profession of medicine what about dynasties in journalism what about uh, in dynasties in 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 other professions the fact is that the ethos of south asia is a very feudal ethos we are a feudal people and we look upon or we look up to an individual so that's the way we are this is a reality and this is the reality this is the reality and so therefore if you have to go on to the next level of reform political reform will only be a subset of the larger social reform in south asia whereby you will but have maybe a paradigm shift you know as generations change but wouldn't a political reform like this also be an indication that the congress party is really willing to introspect and look amongst its rank and file you believe in the principles of democracy and you're going to start it within a party democracy i mean don't you think that that's something that would work well uh going forward to 2019 well think? you actually did that so therefore you had uh, mr narsim rao hmm. as the president of the indian national congress and the prime minister hmm. you had mr sitaram kesari you know who is not from the nehru gandhi family as the uh, president of the indian national congress you had dr manmohan singh as prime minister you know a man who came from very humble roots and unlike the current prime minister does not make a virtue out of it but actually makes a virtue out of the hard work which he did to come where he 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 did in life so therefore it's not that in the long march of the congress party you've not had people who were not from the nehru gandhi family at the helm of affairs and so therefore this is a dynamic process and if you look at it both in the national students union of india and the indian youth congress you have a fairly democratic ethos mm-hmm. and as we go along you may find that it would get institutionalized by this person who is now the congress president and who has actually led this first wave of reforms uh, in the youth congress and the nsui in the congress party itself Okay so you're saying basically it's a perception battle as well apart from the real work that the congress has to do in terms of introspection on policy as you as you mentioned some of it is a perception battle that well i think the best answer on dynasty was given by rahul gandhi himself in berkeley mm. you know where he actually pointed out uh, to the instances of dynasty you know across the firmament uh, whether it was in bollywood or it was in the indian industry or even in the indian academia But which I is but i think the question <laughs> then the, the question that that is uh, begot by this is just because there's a justification for nepotism in dynasty doesn't always make it right we're a country of you know billion people there must be more merit than just one family well uh, maya you have a point but you see the 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 fundamental assumption that because you have people from a particular family adopting that same profession uh it is nepotistic you know i re- uh, respectfully disagree and the reason i disagree is that you may get the first movers advantage but ultimately year after or every 5 years you are being tested in the court of people and if you're not good if you're not good you're going to be rejected the fact right. is that you have dhumal's son dhumal himself lost Correct. but uh, his son is now a third term mp so. you have uh, uh, vasundhara raj's son you know dushant who's now i think a third term mp you have uh, raman singh's son 
who is, 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 is also a member of parliament. You have Mamta Banerjee's nephew. Right. I mean, if you can extend that to... So, 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 so the so, ultimate test is always at the ballot and you've got many more tests to come oh, to go in the next, uh, next eight, uh, 12 to 18 months. For sure, Manish Tawari, thanks very much. Thank for you, Maya. To us at Wide Angle. Thank you.